hello everyone, welcome. We are fortunate to have one of my former students and friends here to talk about architecture. Mr. Carl Sergio is here, and I wanted to give you a little bit of background about Mr. Sergio. He is an alum like many of all of you will be at some point. He's from the class of 1999. He went on and graduated from Notre Dame in 2004, majoring in psychology and art and design with a focus on furniture design. He went on after that to study architecture. He got his master's in architecture at the University of Illinois in Chicago, and he focused on modernism and sustainable design while there. Currently, Mr. Sergio is a senior design associate for Kripe Architects and Engineers in Indianapolis, and he focuses on buildings that relate to education, healthcare, retail, and urban development. You also might want to know that Mr. Sergio is a published book illustrator. He is a accomplished guitarist. He also builds guitars. He's a carpenter. He's a huge Notre Dame football and basketball fan. He speaks German, Spanish, and Italian. So what's not to like? He's a real Renaissance man. So Benvenuto, Mr. Sergio. Um, but 
it appears that people outside the field have also, I guess, had insightful thoughts about it. So I just kind of like that as a little fact. Um, so anyway, my, my little story that I'll try and make quick um, obviously starts at Trinity. And uh, I always talk about the people in my life and how they matter and how they've kind of helped me get to where I am because I think that people are important. And I wouldn't have ever come here if it wasn't for the Fulcher family and the Ash family. And you guys probably, you know, most people may not even know those families anymore, but they were two of my best friends in grade school and they came here and I wanted to go here with them and thankfully my dad wanted to send me here anyway. Um, I guess it was his idea, but I sort of agreed maybe. <laughs> Um, so yeah, you know, like, it's just, uh, like, Dave and, Dave, Ash and Josh Holter have been two of my longest friends, and it's just kind of cool to see how my life story has started with, um, coming here with them. Um, so these are my drawings from seventh grade, and that was the first time that I found out, like, wow, I kind of like art, and I guess I'm okay at it. Um, and I also really liked pencil, because it was very exact and very precise. Uh, it was just, you know, I could, I could get like kind of a photo realism. Um, the only problem is it took me way too long to do it. <laughs> um, and other stuff from, you know, I know you guys are taking art here, so it's like these are the things that I did while I was here. Um, I don't necessarily think this one is terribly great, but I hated watercolors actually. <laughs> they're like the opposite of pencils, they're just, you know, there's water everywhere, and they smear, and I just don't like it. Um, I did a self-portrait, which was kind of weird. Um, <laughs> I realized that I'm cross-eyed, and the reason is that I drew my face with a mirror like this, and so the whole time I was like looking into the mirror. And it wasn't until after I was done, I was like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> That's okay. Um, I also love music. Scribbles are all music lyrics from different songs. You can see I have headphones on. This was back in the day. <laughs> when we listened to audio cassettes. It was crazy. Um, so then I went on to college, and uh, this is one of the things I did in the art program in Notre Dame, and I actually really like it. Um, it's, it was Conte Cram, which is kind of like charcoal, but um, a little earlier, but. I really just took art as a second major because I didn't know what else to do and I really liked art and it was kind of nice to get out of the classroom and just go work on art and I really never thought anything would come of it but um, I really just kind of stuck with it. I didn't even intend to finish the major. I was a psych major and art was just like a hobby on the side. Um, so I did kind of you know, things with a bunch of different materials. Um, this is an oil painting. I can't take all the credit because it's a copy of another artist, but that was like the assignment was to copy somebody else. Um, it's hanging in my apartment still, so I guess I like it. Um, I did a, this was like a self-portrait, um, and at the time, like, I was, I was graduating and I was, you know, finishing college and I was like, I don't know what to do with my life or my career, I don't know what I want to study, I know a lot of things that I like, and so I kind of thought this was indicative of me sort of like it's a it's a sunset or a sunrise reflected in my eye, and I kind of like the duality of sort of looking back and also looking forward. It's like you don't know if the sun is setting or if it's rising, and that's kind of what I was doing at the time. Like looking forward to the future, I don't know where I'm going, looking back at the past, all my college friends are graduating, this is lame. Um, so, again, to touch on the people, like my Uncle Al, I went to dinner with uh, Al Scott, who used to be the basketball coach. I went to, him, to dinner with him and my aunt and just kind of talking about I don't know what to do and my uncle was like, well, you love art, why don't you just finish your art program? And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. At least will buy me six more months to figure out what to do with my life. So I did that. And I took a furniture studio. And again, and I realized this is kind of weird looking, but it's a, it's a coffee table. And um, actually the significance here was that uh, I wanted to have all my friends sign piece of wood on the top, so there's, there's, it doesn't look like that many, but it's like over a hundred different signatures um, from all my college friends. I kind of had them all come over to my dorm room at different times, and I all signed it, and so I still have it, um, which is just kind of a cool memory. And uh, this is a good time to actually talk about um, 
I started realizing that, you know, I always kind of knew that I was creative, but I think that word gets misused. You know, people think like, like artistic, because that, that's what it means when you're creative. But creative really comes from the word create. And I realized at some point that that was what I liked doing best, was actually creating something, like producing something. And I loved furniture design because it was an opportunity to actually make something that existed in the real world. And, you know, looking back, maybe I should have realized that architecture would be a good fit for me, but at the time I had no idea. Um, I took a perspective test at the beginning of my freshman year, and it had like all these different, you know, areas of interest, and then there's this giant spike on architecture, and I was like, oh geez, um, what do I, you know, it was a five-year program, and I was already done with my freshman year. I was like, I came from college for six years. So I was like, well, I guess maybe in another lifetime I'll be an architect, but uh, I'm an architect now, so I guess I made it, um, just kind of came around. So after this, um, you know, again, with, with people helping me out, like, I did not know what to do at college. And my dad was like, he loved playing guitar, he loved building furniture. I found out you can go to guitar school and learn how to make guitars. And I was like, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. So I went to Atlanta and we got to, I went to this school for like three months and this started out as just like a raw piece of, uh, I think it was walnut, I think, um, yeah. And you'd start out with a raw, like a board and you know, then you cut it out and you paint it. And um, this was right before I had to sand off all the paint because we did it wrong. <laughs> Um, and then when you're done, you have a finished guitar, which was just amazing. And again, it, like, it was about the process of creating, like taking, you know, making something from nothing, like just a raw piece of lumber that you get at Lowe's, and using a bunch of machines, and I mean, of course, a lot of metal too, which I guess is cheating. Um, and then I had a guitar, um, and I did, you know, little inlays in it and everything. It was just, it was really fun. And, the thing for me along the way of the story is that I, it took me a long time to discover, I guess, what I really wanted to do or what my passions were, what my skills were. And I had a lot of friends in college who kind of got on that career track. I think, you know, education these days can tend to, um, I realize I'm in a school talking about theories about education, so I have to be careful, but education can tend to, you know, college especially can encourage you to like declare your major as a freshman and next thing you know, like 40 years later, like, why am I doing this? I don't even like engineering or finance or whatever. Um, so I kind of took the opposite approach, which didn't necessarily work out so great either in the short term, but I made it to where I wanted to be, so um, it worked out in the long run. Um, so some more images of just me creating. Um, my parents' pool needed to be painting years ago, so I started thinking, well, why, you know, it's like, this, it's a canvas, basically, it's this giant white bottom, like, why just paint it white or blue again? Let's have some fun, you can see it from, you know, planes and stuff, so I started kind of sketching around a bunch of different ideas about what we could put on the bottom, and, um, you know, I liked some of these really swoopy, swirly designs, but um, unfortunately, we just kind of, this was, this was the first time, and it was just uh, sort of a, you know, the basic, like, what I could get done in the bottom of the pool, but I stared at it for years, and I'm just like, I'm not satisfied with that. And finally, it came around time to paint it again, and we got a little crazier. Um, you can maybe barely see that there's, like, a chalk outline that goes all the way down there. My mom actually helped me, which was awesome. My dad helped me, too. Um, and so that was a lot more gratifying because it was like a, it felt like a real work of art. Um, and again, like I get a lot of um, excitement and a lot of, uh, I guess, just feeling good about it. Like when I, when I make something, I do something that's there in the world and I can kind of step back and look at it and be like, wow, yeah, I did that. And it's not even in, in a sort of like arrogant way, it's almost like in a kind of humble way. Like, that thing is really amazing, but I did it. That's awesome, you know. And so I've never, I've never felt pride in my work in a sense of of being arrogant about it. I've always been 
proud of things that I've done in the sense like I can't believe, you know, that I guess God gave me these skills to do these things and I actually made it happen. Um, so like this swirl never happened, but the rest of it turned out pretty well. Unfortunately, um, it rained shortly thereafter. <laughs> and I mean like literally as we're, you know, as we're finishing, these chairs are holding up a tarp that's trying to start protecting some of the other thing I painted. And I don't know if it was the rain or just the paint was old, but um, the whole thing ended up peeling off that summer. So, you know, my dad would go swimming and come up with like a sheet of paint, <laughs> lay it down on the sidewalk. And I was like, thank you, that's great. There's my art on the sidewalk. <laughs> so, that made me want to just punch myself in the face. <laughs> Um, uh, this is Susie mentioned that I was, there's one more finished picture, um, before the pain started feeling. Um, she mentioned that I was a published illustrator, I, I illustrated Mr. Stowe's book years ago, he was nice enough to ask me to do it, and it was a really cool opportunity, and now you can like Google me and I'm on Amazon, which again is just amazing and really cool. Um, it was a historical novel set in North Carolina. Um, so this was from an actual photo, and again, this is a pencil, like, I, you know, I've never touched watercolors again. <laughs> but I, I use pencil all the time, and I drew a bunch of portraits for the book. Um, so again, you know, this was just a hobby, like a side thing I'm creating while I'm working at some other job that I hate. And it's like, this is the kind of stuff I really enjoy doing, but I just couldn't figure out where I wanted to go, what I really wanted to do. Um, but I kept at it. There's a picture of me actually drawing the thing, which my dad took the photo, I think. Um, it was just kind of a cool thing to like see in the process of creation. Um, and I did a few more things for friends when somebody had a baby. I drew this, and this is actually probably one of my most favorite things I've ever done. And I gave it to them, so it's hanging in their house in Minneapolis. So I visit it when I can. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I did a firehouse in Chicago for a friend's uncle, and there's a photo on the left and the drawing on the right, um, so I like drawing from photos. Um, you know, I do consider myself creative, but drawing from imagination is just impossible, so I need photographs. Um, and then one more, you may have recognized these two, uh, I did this for Monica Go, um, Sister, so I don't know where this one's hanging, but it's kind of cool. Um, so moving on. Um, after that, though, I you know I, I knew that I liked art, I knew that I liked psychology, and I thought about going into art therapy. And art therapy is a program where you you know you're, you're being a psychologist or like a counselor, but you're doing it with art. You're providing children or prison inmates or something like ways of expressing themselves through art. And I thought, oh great, I could be a psychologist artist. Um, and so I looked into that program and, you know, again, like I valued the opinion of the people around me. And so I kind of emailed uh, a dozen or so of my closest friends and my family members and said, you know, what do you think of art therapy? Um, do you think I'd like it? This is what the program is like. These are the things I'm interested in. Obviously, this would be a good fit for me. I just don't know. And everyone was like so supportive and emailed me back and <coughs> phone calls and whatever. Like, that'd be great. Um, I'm really excited for you. I think that'd be a perfect fit. You'd be so happy, blah, blah, blah. And my brother was the one person who's sitting back there who was like, I just thought you'd be a good architect. And I was like, What? Why would you say that? I'm, I'm like ready to go to art therapy school. Now I have to start over again. So I emailed everybody again. Like, um, two options now, please vote. Because <laughs> I honestly just didn't know, you know? You just, sometimes you don't know until you, you start something. It's like, well, they both sound interesting, but I don't know, what do other people think? And I, I emailed everybody, and again, like, everyone was very supportive, and I got kind of half and half, like, yeah, you should do architecture, you know, you should do architecture, you know, different reasons. Um, but the one person's comment that stuck with me and hopefully his kids are here. Are the Bender kids here? Yeah. Where are you guys? Eli and uh, Drew? Yeah. Your dad, he, he's a good friend of mine still. I don't see him very much, but he was a psych professor and he still is. Um, 
I had classes, a bunch of classes with him. And uh, we didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I valued his opinion about things nonetheless. And he was the one person, you know, he was a psychologist. And he said, you're not going to be happy in psychology. He's like, it's all research and writing papers and following rules. There's not going to be any creativity, very little, you know, artistic expression. He's like, I think architecture is going to be right for you. And there's a lot of psychology in architecture, which, you know, I've come to realize. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you're right. And so that's what I did. I went ahead and applied to architecture school, and I've never looked back since. Um, you know, I, I realized that I was in the right place when it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, finals week, and I'm, you know, trying to peel my contacts out and put glasses on and drink more caffeine and build a model. And, um, and I was still really happy there, even though it was like, you know, miserable in the moment. It was like, I am glad I'm in architecture school. And that was an amazing feeling for me because when I was at Trinity, um, you know, I was good at math and science and I was interested in different things and the same with college, but I never felt like I would find a field that really satisfied at least most of my skills and my interests. I mean, I really genuinely am just like, I'm never, like there isn't a career out there that will it will be who I am that I will be happy with, like, this is me. And I found architecture one way or the other, I guess, you know, through the influence of my brother and Dr. Venter. And um, so it's been amazing and, and humbling and gratifying to be able to, you know, say stuff like that. Um, and there's my brother and I traveling in Paris, so that's the guy. <laughs> So, on to talking about being an architect a little bit, and I'm already beginning uh, to go faster, but this was just something that somebody posts online. So I kind of look online, I kind of looked online just as I was putting this together, like I wonder what people online say about being an architect. You know? and, um, and these are all true, but I mean, none of these reasons are why I do it in particular. Um, I mean, there is an amazing opportunity to impact people's lives because you're building things that people and the choices that you make will influence how people use the buildings and how it impacts their lives. And, you know, if you design an office space, like, people could be miserable or they could be really happy. And that can even influence their productivity and influence the finances of the business that works in the building. So you constantly think about that kind of stuff. Um, and so one thing I did when I, you know, when I went to school was, like, I know that this is an important thing. And I, you know, I wanted to be about something more than just doing buildings. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that that I started off the way I wanted to finish. That you know, on day one of grad school, it was like, okay, you know, I chose to be here. I took out like a million dollars of student loans, and now I'm here, so I'm going to do it right. And um, and that's been important to me every day since. Every little choice that I make, um, personally and professionally, I try to understand the impact of it on my future and on my life. So <laughs> this is just uh, you know a few other things I found online about about the real truths about being an architect. This one, this one is true. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. But that's true for any of you these days. Also true. <laughs> um, but the interesting thing about this one is that, you know, a lot of people in architecture complain like I have a life and I'm working all the time. I, I don't have a life because my life is architecture. Um, I'm constantly involved in, in other extracurricular things outside of work. Um, in Indianapolis now, in Chicago, where I was for eight years. Um, I still try and stay involved in Chicago, even though I'm not there. Um, because I'm just so passionate about the field that, you know, like anything that's going on, it's like, I want to be there, I want to be part of it, I want to do things to help the city. I'm like part of a little design group that's designing a park or some neighborhood for Indianapolis, and we're just doing it for free for a nonprofit, just because we want to do it because it's good for the city. Um, other things about being an architect, I may be a little dark and small, but it says architects always wear black unless it's hot. 
then I wear black. Um, that's one of the things I don't really ascribe to. I actually hate wearing black, so I try and wear bright colors as much as I can. Um, I think wearing black all the time, head to toe, is kind of lame. But that's your personal experience. I just like I spend a lot of time in art and music and architecture, and you know, everyone thinks it's really hip to wear black from head to toe, and I just don't understand. It's like you were zero creative this morning when you picked out a black shirt from your black closet and put it on with black pants. I don't, I don't understand how you're a creative person. It's made sense. I'm like, wear shoes that match with the jacket. That's creative. <laughs> Didn't match my, my iPad cover, my iPhone. It's like, I'm a little crazy. Um, so a few more things. That one, unfortunately, can often be true, too. It's kind of like the field of law where people end up just working too hard and, you know, not ending up with good personal relationships. But, you know, that goes back to starting out the way I want to finish. I knew from day one, like, someday I'm going to have a family, and I can't work 80 hours a week, so I'm not going to work 80 hours a week in grad school either, because then I'm going to get used to doing that, and that's going to be the only way I know how to get my work done. That one's kind of funny. Um, also true, but the stuff really happens. Um, but some other funny things about being an architect, like, oh, this is really funny. Um, in addition to, uh, you know, wearing con red jackets, you can also have cool watches, and have a watch that matches your water bottle, theoretically. Um, or you can wear crazy glasses. I don't really ascribe to the crazy black glasses thing either, but I guess that goes with the whole black thing, so. Um, but a lot of people do. Um, one thing that's definitely not true about architects, I don't know how many people watch How I Met Your Mother. How I Met Your Mother is a giant lie about architects. No 27-year-old will ever design a skyscraper in Manhattan, ever. So, the show kind of bothers me, but on the other hand, I happen to be very much like Ted Mosby in a lot of other ways, which is kind of alarming. <laughs> it's like he stole my personality. It's really strange. Um, <laughs> this one is just plain funny and really nerdy, because um, you'd have to even know what modernism is, but that's a really in Chicago. Um, we just had Valentine's Day, so I thought it was appropriate. Um, so a few other things about being an architect. And you really don't need to be good at math and physics. A lot of people think you know you have to be a whiz at that stuff. But you don't necessarily. You don't even need to be an artist. You don't have to be good at drawing. You don't even draw anymore. We use computers. Um, but you do have to have some of those. Um, what you do really need, though, is to be what they call a jack of all trades and a master of none. Um, because we work constantly with engineers and contractors, the guys who build the buildings, um, developers, the guys that fund the buildings, um, you know, code enforcement, permitting the city. So I'm constantly working with a bunch of other people in different fields, and somehow I'm expected to know how they do their job and know all about their job in addition to doing my own. So you tend to end up looking like you don't know what you're talking about all the time. It's like I know enough engineering to talk to the engineer, but he obviously knows more than I do. And the same thing goes with the contractor or the developer or the nonprofit. Like, they all know more about their job, but I have to know enough about it to be able to work with them. So it's very, they call it a lifetime learning field. And people in the, in the field of architecture, you know, work until, until they die. Frank Lloyd Wright, or a guy in Brazil, Oscar Niemeyer, he just passed away. He was, I think, 103 or something, and he was still like designing buildings. Um, and that's just common in the field of architecture. Because, you know, we, we, have, we just we have to do everything. Um, but I see it as a good thing. Um, I've always loved learning, even though I struggled with it back when I, you know, didn't know why I had to take this random. You know, philosophy course, or like, you know, what does this French novel have to do with my life or something? But I've always loved learning, and it's just a question of finding what you want to learn about, and then you'll enjoy it. Um, other things that you kind of need or help to be an architect um, it helps to have the color of your presentation um, to match your novel. <laughs> And I did think about that. 
Um, you see, the thing about being an architect is that you're constantly thinking about the decisions you're making out in the world um, and how they affect every other decision. So, if I was designing, you know, this building and I decided I wanted bigger windows, well then suddenly there's less wall and the wall holds up the ceiling, and then I need to figure out a different way to hold up the ceiling. And now that there's less wall, the insulation is worse, so maybe I have to buy a bigger heater to keep the building. And then the cost of the building goes up, and all of a sudden they're like, whoa, not that much money. And now, you know, all that is just because I wanted a bigger window. And that happens every day in my job. Um, I mean, even if you, you know, if you decided you wanted to move the front row of chairs, like, oh, this chair's really a foot too close, we need to move them. Well, then you have to move that row, and then, like, all the way. And that's, like, that's my job in a nutshell, in a sense, is, knowing that all these tiny decisions affect every other decision that you make and it's um, a blessing and a curse because you know I can apply it to my life but it's it's like when I'm home my mom asks me if I want to take some cookies back to Indianapolis with me. Yeah sure. How many cookies do you want? Um I don't know, how big is this a black bag? Well how many let's see if I have five then I'll have one for every day next week. If I have ten then you know I can have one for lunch and one for dinner. How, is, how many did you? I don't know. Just put some in a black bag, please. <laughs> <laughs> and that honestly happens, and it's like I'm losing my mind, and it's my job's fault. <laughs> but that really happens. Um, so one thing I want to show you is a short video, um, and uh, this is a guy who uh, is, in my opinion, right now the best architect in the world, and he does just really cool, amazing stuff. Um, and it's just a really short clip about some design work that he has done. Uh, and it's him presenting, and I realize that he sounds like Arnold Schwarzenegger. A very little way of showing it is a project we did for a library and a hotel in Copenhagen. Uh, the design process was like really tough, almost like a survival. But sort of gradually an idea evolved, this sort of idea of a rational tower that melts together with the surrounding city. So sort of expanding the public space onto what we refer to as a Scandinavian version of the Spanish steps in Rome. But sort of public on the outside as well as on the inside with the library. So um, the second story that I, that I like to tell is um, actually starts uh, in my own house. This is my apartment. This is the view from my apartment over this sort of landscape of triangular balconies that uh, our client called the Leonardo DiCaprio balcony. Um, and uh, they form this sort of a vertical backyard where on a nice summer day you actually get introduced to all your neighbors in a vertical radius of 10 meters. The house is sort of a distortion of a square block trying to uh, zigzag in to make sure that all the apartments look at the straight views instead of into each other. And so recently this was the view from my apartment onto this place where our client actually bought the neighbor site and he said that he was going to do an apartment block next to a parking structure. And we thought, like, rather than doing like a traditional stack of apartments looking straight into a big, boring block of cars, why don't we actually turn all the apartments into penthouses, put them on a podium of cars? And because Copenhagen is completely flat, if you want to have a nice south-facing slope with a view, you basically have to do it yourself. Um, then we sort of cut up the volume so we wouldn't block the view from my apartment. Um, <laughs> And uh, essentially the parking is sort of occupying the deep space underneath the apartments and up in the sun you have like a single layer of apartments that combine sort of all the splendors of a suburban lifestyle like a, a house with a garden with a, a sort of metropolitan view and a sort of dense urban location. So this is our first architectural model. This is an aerial photo we taken last summer. And essentially the apartments cover the parking, they're accessed through this diagonal elevator it's actually a standard product from Switzerland, because in Switzerland they have a natural need for diagonal elevators. Um, and, uh, and the facade of the parking, we wanted to make the parking naturally ventilated, so we needed to perforate it. And we discovered that by controlling the size of the holes, we could actually turn the entire facade into a gigantic, naturally ventilated, rasterized image. And since we always refer to the project as the mountain, we commissioned this Japanese Himalaya photographer to give us this beautiful photo of Mount Everest, making the entire building a 3,000 square meter artwork. So that, um, you know, I don't do cool stuff like that every day. He 
does, but that, in a sense, is a, is a, a very simple way to kind of show you how you can design and how you can really have fun, um, but also how that you can do something new and different out in the world with, you know, existing things. I mean, it was just apartments on top of parking, and they came up with something really cool and really different, and it, you know, solved problems that maybe people didn't even know they had. So the opportunity as an architect is really to, you know, not to design buildings that already exist or not to do things the way things have always been done, um, but to start to look at problems from a new um, perspective. Um, one of the, the things that I enjoy the most about the field is just the aspect of problem solving, just having problems and issues to figure out and how to come up with a creative solution that you know, either looks cool or spends less money or saves energy or something like that. Um, I'll show you quickly a project that I worked on in school just to talk about the design process. Um, so this was in Chicago and we had this, um, we had this, uh, this lot here was an existing empty park space and this is where the current downtown Chicago library is, which um, I could give a long opinion of why I don't like that building, but that's another time. Um, but anyway, you know, I was trying to think about uh, circulating through the space, like people using it. I wanted it to be a part of the urban fabric. Um, I wanted, because the current library that's there is like a fortress, it's like a castle. And you just walk around it, and it's hard to even know how to get in. So I really wanted it to be a part of the city, and there are people walking everywhere. And I thought, you know, you've got the, the subway right here with these two red line stations, and then these are actually all bus stops. Um, and then these circles were from various entrances to other adjacent buildings. And I just started to think, like, what if people wanted to walk straight through the site rather than having to go down the street and around the corner, you know, to get somewhere else? And I, I just sort of used that as a literal way of designing the building. And I cut a model out of insulation foam um, as a way of trying to look, you know, if I cut these paths through a three dimensional object, what kind of volumes would they start to create and how can these volumes actually eventually turn into buildings um, and I turned it into like this is an actual floor plan so you know I looked at well okay these could even be wide enough to be roads um, we can put some parking in here but then you know these are different volumes that are cut out by the paths where I could put like an auditorium and a theater and maybe a meeting space and a coffee shop and things like that um, and then turning it into like an actual model, just because I needed more space for the actual library, I thought, well, I could put the library over the top, and these paths start to, you know, actually carve into the top volume where you can get light coming down. And since we already had an existing park here, I thought, why don't we just draw the park up on top of the building and make this entire space a huge park on top of the building, and then we can get some sunlight down through the building, and these are big light wells that go all the way down to the ground floor. Um, and this was just a, you know, one semester at studio project that I worked on. Um, that was just kind of the design process that I went through, but it was just really fun to sort of look at the problems there and decide what to do with them. Um, unfortunately, after I got out of school, uh, that was me. So, um, however, I did get a job, and one other design project that we'll talk about, um, we met with the school again. As in, you know, because of the process of talking about education. Um, and they wanted us to design like a whole site plan for this giant area. And, you know, this is like a full size stadium track, that's a water tower. So you can see like the size of this plot of land. And all they had were these two existing buildings. Um, and so we sat with them for a day just interviewing them and asking them questions and trying to figure out what they were. And what they really wanted was, you know, some kind of alternative mode of education. And I'm going to show you one more video that I actually showed to them. Like, you know, is this what you're really thinking? Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century. How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? 
The second, though, is cultural. Every country on Earth, on Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. And so people say we have to raise standards if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, something like that. I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. We have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, so ringing bells, separate facilities, uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. <laughs> well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines. You know, or at different times of the day. Or better in smaller groups than in large groups. Or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula. And it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. So, at, at this point, I suppose I should emphasize that I'm not saying anything about the education here because I actually tell everybody that I had a fantastic high school education and I wouldn't be where I was today without it. Um, so that's not the intention at all. Um, but the point was to talk about if we're designing a school or if we're designing any building, anything at all, from the ground up, from nothing, the possibilities are infinite. You know, what do you really want? What does it really want to be like? So rather than just assuming that you do things the way they're always done, um, you watched this video and kind of talked about well, what possibilities are there out there to do things the way they haven't been done, and how could those lead to maybe a model of education that you guys really want that would you know help out your mission. Um, unfortunately, after a whole morning of like four hours of design, I mean, we ended up with this. And I don't want to blame my coworkers, but there were just people that have been architects for a lot longer. And this, you know, kind of looks like a college campus with like maybe a little main circle here and, and a quad and everything. And it's like, okay, that's nice, but you know, I mean, colleges were designed like that a hundred years ago. And so at lunchtime, I kind of got up there, and this was actually like the best moment I've had in my short career so far. Um, and if this story, then I'm done. Um, but. Um, I got up there and I, I showed them this video while we were eating lunch while I had a moment to break and so after the video it was just like, you know, I mean this sounds like what you guys really think, like what you really want. And they, they were talking about collaboration between grades and across subjects and how to achieve that. And I was like, do we really want to just, you know, put each grade in a separate building? Like, I don't understand how that's educational collaboration. And so I said, well here's what I've been thinking. If you break down, the, you know, each grade into a into essentially a unit, and um, and you know, start to relate them to one another. And the the shape of this was kind of because I wanted to align them along this road, um, which is currently blue. Um, so anyway, I was starting to think about you know each one of these cubes as a separate as a separate grade level. Um, and how would these cubes start to interact with each other? And that's why they sort of overlap along this curve. And what the curve kind of provided for me was an opportunity for spaces out here where you think like, okay, you know, the junior high school, for example, gets out and has lunch, and this is in Texas, so it would be warm, and they could all sit out here, and, um, you know, I realize there are other issues of security or keeping the kids, you know, from 
getting crazy when they're, you've got juniors and seniors with 7th and 8th graders or something like that, but you guys deal with the same thing here, you know, it's like, well, we've got different ages, and how do we kind of keep control over this and that, and, but again, we were just talking about what's possible. Um, so then I, I kind of got more serious with it, and this, you know, this was like a five-minute thing at lunch that I was talking about while everyone was kind of stuck in their faces, and it was the only time I had to like get in my two cents because everyone else, like my, you know, my bosses and things, like I didn't want to kind of interrupt what they were doing, but you know, I sketched these out and kind of put them on the site. I was like, you know, looking at how they would fit. Um, and starting again to sort of look at these areas of interaction where these could be like even restrooms or little lounge spaces. Um, and even showed them this image of bubbles. And it was just like, you know, you've got all these different sizes. They're not necessarily regular shapes, um, but they all kind of interact and relate to one another. Um, and you have opportunities for, you know, a small bubble being a restroom and a larger bubble being a classroom and a big bubble maybe being the auditorium or the cafeteria or something like that. And, um, you know, then I sketched over the top of that to kind of turn my shape into some bubbly shapes and thinking about how this could be like all the administration and have some, have all these be different little classrooms out here. And, um, after I was done with my little spiel, I mean, I was really nervous and <laughs> our client kind of looked at me and was just like, what were you smoking last night? <laughs> This could have gone one of two ways, and then went the bad way. And then all of a sudden, he went up there and he started drawing on top of himself, and he got really into it. And you know, the next thing I know, like two hours later, this is our drawing of the site, and these are our buildings. And my coworker had even gone so far as to think, like, well, the penny, like, because we were trying to use the right scale, and these pennies were actually the right size. That this could be like an individual classroom. And so it was starting to like put together all these classrooms, and then like. You know, a cluster of them could be, could be offices or could be administration or something. And, and the nice thing about them is that they were modular. You could pick up a penny and put it somewhere else. You could add, when you're thinking about future growth like that, you could add more pennies later when you, you know, need more building space as the school grows. And um, it was just amazing to see how far we had come in a couple hours. And I was really, you know, again, I wasn't like arrogant about it. I was kind of like gratified that it happened, but it was just, Amazing that, and I was glad too that we'd gotten to this point from from that previous drawing. Um, but that's kind of how it happens sometimes. The way we design, um, it's a very collaborative process. And sometimes you can go off in left field and take a big gamble, um, and this time it just happened to work out. So hopefully we'll actually get to design school because right now it's just a design process. Um, but that is all I have to say. Now, so if anyone has questions for me, I'll get silent. Many of you, you know, I don't know if you've heard of them or not. Um, we talk about them coming to South Bend, which they kind of come from. Um, but they're kind of like a smaller uh, competitor of Whole Foods, and that's almost all I do these days. Um, and there's almost no design work involved, which is unfortunate because, you know, like I said, I like creating and designing. Um, but there's a lot of other project management skills and other things required of me that. Um, great skills for the future to be an architect and um, one thing I do love to do is travel and actually go see buildings and the nice thing is once they start all under construction um, in Minnesota, in Missouri, 10 of them in Florida, um, the second half of this year I'll get to just go travel and I get to actually go see the buildings which is a really amazing experience even if it's a boring grocery store is to actually walk into a building four times the size of this and realized that I drew every single little detail in the building on my computer, printed it out on paper, and now it exists, it's like it's there, you know? And that's one of the best things about my job is, is actually being able to create. 
you have other pictures of cool buildings if you want me to just uh, if there are no more questions and kind of scroll through. That's a tough one. What was the question? Um, my favorite architectural building. Um, well, the question actually reminds me that I should have uh, distinguished between architecture and buildings, because, for example, this I would consider architecture, but, you know, somebody's house or, like, a 7-Eleven, that's just kind of a building. Um, but uh, some of my favorite buildings are in Chicago. Um, there's the, and to name them, I don't know that would really help, I suppose I could pull up the but um, the Thompson Center in Chicago, um, the Aqua Tower, Millennium Park, actually, um, an amazing place. And the thing about the thing about a lot of my favorite buildings in Chicago, in particular, is that they get a lot of criticism because they stand out. Um, a lot of people even think they're ugly. There's uh, two buildings called Marina City, and they look like they're called the Corn Cob Towers, and they sit on the river. Um, a lot of people think they're really ugly, but what they've done is changed the face of the city. Instead of the whole city downtown being just these glass boxes rising up to the ceiling, all of a sudden we've got something different. And, you know, it just goes back to doing things the way that they've always been done. Like, I just don't really, I don't see any reason to do that. And it doesn't add anything to the city. Um, so, my favorite buildings are really the ones that stick out like sore thumbs, because that architect has decided I want to do something different. I want to push the envelope. I want to design something that people are going to remember that's going to impact the face of the, of the city, you know, that's, that is going to stick out. Um, so, I always argue with people, say, even if you think it's ugly, it's a worthwhile thing on the face of the city because it's changed the way the city looks. And most of those other buildings do not.
glass is unbelievable because it lets through light. Glass can be, you know, a million different colors. Um, glass can either let views through or it can hold views back. Um, it can let through, you know, the heat of the sun. It can make you feel connected to a space by offering you a view of the outside, or you can even have a view of another room. Um, they even do bathrooms with glass walls. Oh my gosh, that's not very private, but, but you can do glass that is okay, like you can't see through it, but light will pass through it. So if you walk up and put your hand on it, you can see the hand, but as soon as you step back, there's nothing. But then, you know, if the bathroom doesn't have any windows and you've got a skylight outside the bathroom, all of a sudden that sunlight is coming into the bathroom and the bathroom is a whole new experience and a lot more transition. Um, so for that reason, yeah, I love glass.